You really think steaks are gonna fix this? No. That's why I also got them Despicable Me on Blu-ray. <laughs> Those minions, man. They just don't listen. It's Broadway Comedy Club Radio. The only podcast that's also a comedy club. With your clearly above average hosts, Al Martin and Clayton Fletcher. Fletcher here in New York City, joined as always by the legendary owner of Broadway Comedy Club itself and author of the great new comedy book, and it's called Did It on a Dare, Al Martin. Al, how you been, buddy? Good, Clayton. Thank you very much for that nice plug of my <laughs> book. By the way, it's Did It on a Dare. I'm sorry, Lucy, my cat is joining us for this session but it's right. didn't on a dare how i built the comedy empire in 30 short years all right not oh, a short right. title but it's, a, it's a short. yeah well it's a long title that's like a 30-year title to read <laughs> <laughs> yeah well how's the book doing al before we bring on our guests let's talk about the it book actually it's with- doing very well you know and yeah. uh you know i can't complain and uh i'm uh uh, getting ready to write the sequel, uh, Did It on a Dare, How I Built the Comedy Empire in 30 Short Years, and COVID has ruined it in uh, 60 <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah, uh, COVID hasn't been fun, but, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And, uh, you know, before we get into all of that, I want you to do the honors, if you would, this week, Al, of introducing the audience to our special guest. Absolutely, our special guest is a longtime comedian, um, a, a very funny guy, uh, has appeared on the sitcom Kevin Can Wait with Kevin James. All right. My doctor took x-rays and said that the jelly that goes between my top two vertebrae is gone. <laughs> it's not the jelly that's gone, guy. It's weakness. No, he showed it to me. It's jelly. <laughs> You can have that one. I know how much you like the burnt crust. Do you remember that about me? Or was it in my file? It's in here. And it's in here. He's been on numerous TV shows. Uh, He's got uh, something uh, coming up. How is um, Cold Roach and Anxiety Sideshow? He's He's all over. He's a very talented guy, uh, and we've been lucky enough to have him on some occasions at Broadway Comedy Club. Christopher Brian Roche. How are you, buddy? Hey, guys. How are you? Hey, 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 Chris, did did we work together many, many moons ago uh, Um, in any gigs? I, I, I seem to remember, unless it was another guy named Roche, Maybe at a country club, like years and years ago on Long Island. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Did you take a hiatus for a while? You, you always. Uh, no, I, you know, I, I did. I was hitting it hardcore. I remember. from uh, 1990 till about 2002, and then after that, my stand-up comedy has been very sporadic. So if this okay. happened, it would have been somewhere in the 90s, probably. We, we. Um, no, I wasn't. That, I started in two thousand three. Oh, I remember, okay. I remember meeting with the club. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I, I've been before, for the last few years. I've been performing there, um, and uh, I gotta say, I really like it. I really like it. You're one of the good guys in this business, Al. Thank you. Uh, you know, there's two guys I, I think of. Uh, even though you and I haven't really worked together a lot, you and Chris Mazzilli are, are, are two of the good guys. And Thank I think, you. Yeah. And I think because you guys know what you, because you guys, you, you're a stand-up comedian, Chris, uh, I know one time made an attempt at it. You, you guys, um, you guys get it. Yeah. I mean, Chris, uh, Chris and I started together back in uh, uh, probably the late eighties, early nineties. Um, we worked together. I remember doing open mics and, and Chris worked at my club. Yeah. Till 95. So, you know, we have the same, a lot of the same viewpoints. And, and uh, you know, when he left initially, there's always that hurt feeling thing and all that. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I got over it. You know, uh, everybody has uh, a right to move on and do 
what they need to do in life. And, you know, as a matter of fact, we've, we've worked on a few things together. Most uh, recently, this, this effort to try to get comedy clubs reopened in New York. Now, We're for now those who might be to- listening, sorry, Al, yeah. but for those who might be listening who might not know who you guys are talking about, Chris Mazzilli is the owner of Gotham Comedy Club, which is a competitor, in a way, of Broadway Comedy Club. But the, although they're both in Manhattan, they're not in the same uh, neighborhood. So Chris Mazzilli... Uh, his original club was on 22nd Street, and the newer one, as of, I, I guess, maybe 10 years ago now, is on 23rd Street. And they even had a TV show there for a while on Access TV called Gotham Comedy Live. And it's interesting, Al, if you connect the dots to uh, people who have gone on to have success in the comedy world that actually started out as either one of your co-workers or one of your employees and how all roads seem to lead back to Al somehow, some way. Yeah, because, you know, when Chris Chris was the first one, he opened Gotham, and then one of my waitresses, Delilah Ramos, went over to Gotham also to work for Chris. Then Delilah left uh, Gotham and opened up her own club called the Laugh Lounge. Yeah, in with the Downey Lower East Philly. Side. Yeah. 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 And, oh, wow. yeah, and then uh, this guy named Marco Elgard uh uh, worked for me as one of my producers and uh, I leased him some space at New York Comedy Club that we weren't using like the second showroom he wanted to open up a little coffee bar or whatever and that kind of went awry <laughs> and a whole separate story but he left and wound up opening Eastville Comedy Club um, <laughs> and then of course I sold New York Comedy Club in 2014 my original venue to uh, Emilio Savone and Scott Lindner. And now they have two branches of that. And of course I have Greenwich Village Comedy Club. So it's very possible half the comedy clubs in Manhattan had, you know, some kind of piece come out of me, you know, at right. some point or another. <laughs> well, Six uh, degrees of Al Martin, right? That's the game we can play. <laughs> I always say com- com- comedy is very simple. It's, it's a very simple formula and not, not a lot of people get it right, but you get it right. He gets it right. They know how to treat comics, which is a, a big thing you don't see at every club. Well, you know, uh, just to correct you on one thing, Chris did stand-up comedy for about five years, you know. Yeah, and well. yeah, yeah, from, from 89 till about uh, 95, he was, and before that, he was an actor. Um, and he he really put a lot into it and really wanted to make it as a stand-up comic. And and was pretty good. I mean, we used him on all the shows, and he got a lot, obviously, a lot of stage time managing the place and stuff. But he earned it, and he he paid his dues, and he was funny. And uh, I think what happens at some point is um, you have to make a decision at some point. Do you become a businessman, or do you become that comic? Uh, it's very hard to do both. Uh, I was lucky enough that I kind of still dabbled in it, but I think Chris kind of just went full force business. Yeah. And and I think he manages acts also. So he really kind of has his hands full with stuff, but this is not the Chris Mazzilli episode. (laughs) Yeah. He's going to have to charge him for this plug. We should interview him next time (laughs) out. Holy cow. We got to get Chris on the show. (laughs) But, we well, have anyway, a Chris on so the show, did, Chris Roach. How did, all, how did it all start for you, Chris, in stand-up comedy? Um, I was, uh, this this company I was working for uh, back in uh, 2000 sent me to a uh, the Dale Carnegie Training Institute for Managers. And that's when I uh, realized something that I've been avoiding, that I had a really uh, a debilitating public speaking fear. Uh, so I, I, my goal was just to get over that. That was my only goal. And I was always the class clown uh, in high school. But then next, uh, long story short, I tried an uh, an open mic and took a comedy class and I was hooked and I never looked back, you know. Who did you study with? Who who, who was? Uh, uh, Peter Bales has a a class here. Oh, okay. Great guy. Another another great guy in the business. And uh, a great comic, yes. For me, the class, I mean, you know, people have different opinions about comedy classes, but for me it worked because I was had that 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 such a big fear of public speaking that it was a real um nurturing environment. 
And then I would say like two years later to trying to be a better stand-up comic, I started taking acting lessons with uh, Joanna Bexon in uh, the city. And then I, I fell in love with acting, which I wasn't expecting. Um, and I just think, you know, all the, those two horses, the stand-up comedy and the acting came in handy when I was on set with Kevin, the first scene, because there's a, there's a timing that comedians get um, and also we know, after a while, we don't realize that we know not to step on our laughs or like Kevin would say something funny. Sometimes other actors would come in too early before the laugh went down. Little things like that, the, the sort of stand-up comedy and the, and the acting classes all paid off when uh, Kevin James walked into a McGuire's Comedy Club on a Wednesday night. Um, I don't know if you know John Trusen. He Oh, Sure. Sure. Sweet guy. He called me up and asked me if I wanted to. It was like a Wednesday. I was sitting home in my underwear. He goes, why don't you come down to the club and, and, and do 10 minutes? We got a small show. Colin Quinn was working out a new, uh, his last special. And I went in there just thinking just to do 10 minutes. And as I'm in the back looking at my notes, Kevin happened to walk in. And I didn't know it at the time because I, I did go in to audition for the part. But I didn't know it at the time that I was cast right there. Wow. In Bohemia. <laughs> that is fantastic. I want to go back, though, Chris, because you brought up a point that uh, has always kind of uh, been a, a bit of a sore spot to me. There's no other art form in the whole world where we look down on people for taking classes. If you want to learn right. acting, you, you have no qualms about saying, I took an acting class with this teacher. If you wanted to be a singer and you took voice lessons, nobody would ever say, hey, right. why, why can't you just sing by yourself? Why do you need to take a class? What is it about comedy and why is there, as you mentioned, Chris, there's like a, there's a, there's a bit of a stigma. You said, I don't know how some people feel about taking yeah. comedy classes. Can you elaborate that on a little bit and help our I, listeners understand why some people think that comedy classes are, are a bad thing or a scam or something? Help us with that. Right. Well, I think um, what I've heard before or overheard when comedians talking um, that you either have it or you don't, which I think that's a little, uh, that's a little cut and dry. Uh, it's a little rough because I, I guess I had it. I had it in, when I was in high school, but I always had that debilitating fear. So the class was like an incubator for me. And I'll be honest, you know, the class was like, let's say the class was uh, six weeks and then we had a graduation show. I took the class like five times in a row because for me, I'm like, I finally found it was like a, a, such an awakening. I found what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I found like-minded people where before maybe I felt like I was an oddball alone in this world. And then all of a sudden <clears throat> I stopped meeting other oddballs like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to be a lawyer growing up, you know, and right. I'm doing this. So yeah, I get it. You know, on the other side of that equation, many, many times I talked to, um, actors and they tell me that their agents and managers tell them to work on a strong you know five or ten minutes because there was many many years where a shortcut for actors to getting discovered was by a stand-up comedy creating right. characters or whatever so many times the agents would have them work on a strong five or ten minutes to be able to do it a stand-up club to hopefully have that agent or manager or I don't know, more so agent manager actually a casting person uh see them but you can always sort of tell can't you like we've all seen the actors that are trying to do stand-up comedy because the uh, manager recommended it <laughs> as opposed to the real comics that have kind of the love for the for the art form of of stand-up right they we can smell them a mile away but i'm not sure that audiences can Audiences don't care. If they make you laugh, they make you laugh, right? Exactly. You know, and if you develop that five minutes, you know. You know, I talk about this in my book, and, and it's a great point that uh, Christopher brings up, and that is why stop uh, doing anything that can help you? Have every weapon that you can available to make you uh, sellable and and viable as, uh, as someone that a casting person can believe it. And that is, if if you have a ton of friends and you can bring them to a show, 
uh, do it. If you can't, there are other ways to make it as a comedian. You can intern, you can uh, bark, you can just go to open mics and, and, you know, eventually, you know, get known and seen in a community, especially like Long Island. There's a whole comedy community unto itself, you know, yeah. and, and it's a very different scene sometimes than, than Manhattan itself. So there are, um, you know, if you can become, if you could take an acting course to get you uh, in the door at some casting agencies or whatever, why not? I, you know, yeah. I always feel it's the person or the people that don't do those things are the ones who are bitching. And whatever reason they don't do it, they can't afford it or they just don't want to put in the time. So they get together at some alternative room or some bar somewhere <laughs> and they start trashing everybody right. because they're not doing it, right? Uh. Yeah, we know how Al feels about the alternative comedy scene. <laughs> well, then those alternative guys, they somehow, uh, they they turn into gatekeepers. <laughs> like, you, you try to get into a festival, you're like, really? I can't get it, you know. Yeah, yeah you're really, too well, this is the reason. If you want to know why Comedy Central uh, has become unfunny, uh, at least I feel oh. that way. It's, it's almost unwatchable. And why a lot of network comedy has become very difficult to watch it's because they're going to alternative rooms to try to find the next big thing, either for Saturday Night Live or for Comedy Central or Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. They're hitting alternative rooms maybe as much, if not more, than the traditional comedy clubs. So, you know, when you're a comedy club, you're in the business of, yes, you want to try to find the next big thing, but you also got to entertain you know, 200 people in a room that want to laugh that night on a Saturday night that are paying their hard-earned money, as opposed to a, um, as opposed to a uh, uh, stand-up, uh, I mean, an alternative room where it's the same 10 or 12 people every week. It's a really a glorified open mic, you know, who are just like, you know, playing dark. It's like a clubhouse, you know, and... Yeah. Uh, it's um, it's a very big different scene, and and when those people who are just playing to each other and not getting the general feedback of everyday people, they're just really pretty much performing for each other. They're not getting the grasp of what makes people laugh. I think something that makes Kevin James so successful is when I watch him on King of Queens or Kevin Can Wait. That's I see me, you know? I, yeah. I, you know, I see a lot of the everyday stuff that I can relate to, you know, but if I watch some alternative comedy show and some guy's talking about some, you know, nonsense experience that only him and his age group and his friends can laugh at, it ain't going anywhere with me, so. Yeah. Now, like, Chris, I'm when you started back in 2003, that seems to me like that might have been the height of the uh, alternative comedy movement right 2003 i'm thinking like surf reality and I, all of those kind of uh Luna lounge and those yeah those those b rooms if you will uh where kind of all that experimental stuff this would be like places where uh you know somebody like zach galifianakis got started janine garofalo kind of like that that whole alternative comedy scene that that eventually did kind of uh produce some big stars so what was your kind of experience when you when you got started early then like what kind of stage time were you able to get and did you end up performing in places like that at that time i did hit a few rooms like that and uh, you know it's interesting as uh, my my first show of course the graduation show where all your family and friends are there you just totally have a great you kill because they're the, your friends and family so i remember going back to an open mic like three or four days later with the same for my second set and do, doing exactly what I did on the first show, which lasted about seven minutes. And I was off stage in like three minutes because there was no, no laughter. There was no laughter because they didn't know who the hell I was. And uh, I remember saying to myself that night when I was wiping away the, the sweat that I want to make strangers laugh like I did my family and friends. I want to make people laugh as hard as I can for as long as I can. And that's always been my goal. Um, I do like, I, I tell like newer comics 
that I think are funny, especially from the, this area of Long Island. I said, you got to get into the city because if you could, I always found that the great comics, if you can make people laugh in those city environments and in the suburban areas, those are the great comics, man. And it's only, uh, I would only say in like the last like three or four years, I've been getting some decent stage time in the city. And I'll, I'll be honest, man, I took a few lumps. I took a few lumps, you know. You can't go into these, uh, you can't go into city rooms and, you know, talking about stuff, uh, driving in your car and stuff, you know, there are certain topics I felt like, um, weren't hitting, but there was also a lot of stuff that I wanted to try that wasn't working on Long Island, uh, or in these, uh, on the road. I was taught early on, like, if you can make it funny, um, on Long Island, it'll be funny in 50 states. So... Or Jersey, Jersey too. Jersey is another great place to do stand up. If you can make it funny there, it'll be funny anywhere. Where, um, like I was saying, sometimes uh, the, these alternative rooms, I've seen those comics come out into the into the burbs, and it's just like you know, very few of them can uh, make the crowds laugh, and vice versa. There are guys who, who come from Long Island going to the city, and people looking at them like they're aliens. Al, uh, what do you think makes a a, a comic? work in new york but not in long island or new jersey or vice versa what do you think makes certain types of acts successful on the road that just don't play well uh in new york city what are your thoughts al well you know i think there's a certain degree of snobbism in uh, manhattan audiences i think it also depends on the room itself because if you take a room like broadway uh, that's a very tourist centric room and a lot of acts like to work in Broadway for the simple reason that because there's so many tourists from all over the country, they know that if something's going to work in New York, it's going to work all over the country generally at my club. Now, if you might go to the comic strip or, um, you know, stand up New York on the Upper West Side, you're going to get more of a, a New York City audience. So you don't always get that knowledge uh, to see whether a, an act will work for tourists, you know, as well. And tourists are important because they're coming in from Nashville, Tennessee, from Florida, from Oklahoma, from Minnesota, from California, you know, from all over the country. So, um, and the sensibilities sometimes are different in other parts of the country than they are in New York. But let's face it, you know, the New Yorkers themselves have a little bit of a, a little bit, a chip on their shoulders. And, you know, they're a little snobby when it comes to their comedy, you know, which I'm born in New York, born and raised in, uh, in Brooklyn and lived on Staten Island for, you know, I, I, I've spent the first 60 years of my life virtually in New York City. But I always tended to love the comics, you know, like the everyday comedians, like Kevin James kills me, you know, uh, 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 you know, Ray Romano. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So and I love, yeah. I love when I did stand up comedy, there was a room out in Long Island that's no longer there called Chuckles, which I think uh, uh, Chris, uh, John Trusen might have booked it before he moved on to Governors. But Chuckles was an unbelievable club. I used to look forward to their Wednesday nights over there where you never know who was going to drop in. And it was, Terrific! It was a, right. a great, you know, you, you felt like you were in a great room with a working class audience, you know, that uh, was much more than, you know, 10 Wall Street guys sitting in the first row with their arms crossed, you know? Yeah. Then you have uh, uh, Eastside Comedy Club where, you know, you get comics like uh, Eddie Murphy that was, uh, I guess you could say, started there. Um, and then you have uh, like somebody like Judd Apatow who used to do dishes. <laughs> He used to wash dishes there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, listen, that's something I'm, I want to, I'm working on a documentary on uh, what people did before they made it big in comedy, you know, made made a success of themselves. What were you doing uh, before the comedy bug hit you? What was your, what was your game plan? Well, um, oh, game plan. <laughs> or, or. Or any any idea what you wanted to do? Well, my Great whole plan is not, maybe not the right word. <laughs> yeah, well, my my whole family, uh, my dad, my two brothers, and my sister uh, are, are all NYPD, all retired now. So here I am, a whole family of cops, 
And I actually gave it a try once, and I was just very unhappy it wasn't for me because, uh, you know, I was always the clown. And even, uh, even when I was a cop for two years, and I was always getting in trouble. Like, uh, for instance, I'd be driving a van full of prisoners to Central Booking, and we're all singing Christmas carols on the way there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, was, I was always getting in trouble. Uh, and that's kind of what my uh, – the, the the sitcom pilot, which is uh, we we've just uh, got funding for it. We're going to film the pilot and put it in film festivals and pitch it. Well, that's what pretty much was about my life um, as a failed police officer to somebody to go. And I managed uh, for 15 years. I managed high end adult stores on Long Island. So that when was when you uh, say high end adult stores, like porn stores or well that's the thing we got very offended when people called them porno stores uh <laughs> they were Sorry, adult right. entertainment stores out so, <laughs> okay so basically what we did was we tried to get away from that image that raincoat image and we made like it was brightly lit um we were trying to appeal to the women to come in you know they say sell to the women close to the man we had a live you know all these things the living room we had set up for the guys to watch tv when you first walked in, it was like Victoria's Secret in the middle. Right. Of it. it was Spencer Gifts in the middle. Then when like you get the, to the, like the Hustler, uh, uh, yes, it was ta it was tastefully done. We were doing it before Hustler even came along with their stores. I'm all for tastefully done types of stores like that. Right. <laughs> you know, then there was like a Bachelorette section and, uh, and stuff like that. So it was a lot of fun, and it was a lot of funny experiences that came from that, which inspired me to write that pilot. So uh, tell us about the pilot. I mean, are you able to talk much about it, or? Well, it's it's still, uh, you know, there's still things working out as far as uh, cast. So I really can't say much on the cast of it. But of course, I went for comics. I went for comics that knew how n know comedic timing. Like Adam Ferrara, I can say his name, a good friend of mine, uh, is, is gonna is gonna play a part. And uh, we also uh, had a few table reads with Krista Stefano uh, playing a part. Um, so I'm really excited about it, and uh, we'll see. You know, it's uh, you know, it's such a you know, you don't know whether it's gonna if somebody's gonna take a bite at it, or you could maybe try to turn it into a YouTube series. Um, but uh, you know, it's I'm I'm learning a lot too, man. I, I was uh, as comedians, we love to create and write. Like Clayton, you said you're working on a screenplay. That that is so much. I love that the coffee and the and the and the, punching up and the table reads but then i got to this point i never got to before where i'm meeting with money people Ooh. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, let's not talk about the suits let's talk about the creative Ooh. process but you Ooh. know uh, one Ooh. of the good things in that area uh is that the old traditional gatekeepers of of uh, people that can say yes or no to your entire career that seems to be coming down a little bit. Those walls are coming down a little bit. That, you know, if you're good and you've got people willing to, you know, back you and move forward, you, you could, you could, you know, there's Amazon Prime, there's, there's uh, Netflix, you know, these network executives, their power is still there, no doubt about it. But there are alternative ways to get your product seen now. Right. And I love seeing these uh, comics say somebody uh, that maybe wasn't getting any interest from Comedy Central and they decided to take their career into their own hands. Like this guy, Andrew Schultz, what he's Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm just amazed by that kid, what, he, what he's doing. And I love that when, uh, even when Louis C.K. was like promoting his, doing his own specials. You know, he was putting them at what was he putting them on YouTube or something like that, rather than yeah. I mean, he was sort of a the the first of the stand up comics to do sort of like his own pay per view thing, you right. know, for five bucks or ten bucks, whatever it was, and and he said, hey, why should HBO be making that money on my right. talent if I I have all these subscribers to LouisCK.com and the, a, a massive mailing list I've developed from touring for years. Let's put it to work. And, you know, so people are sort of making their own uh, their own break. Yeah, and as far as Andrew Schultz goes, uh, he, he has been in the content creation business for a very long time. You know, he's had a very uh, popular YouTube page. Um, then Netflix gave him a deal. I think it was four episodes. Andrew Schultz saves the world or something like that. You can check out on Netflix. Right. Um, but, yeah, he's he's never been short of ideas and uh, content creation, good friend of mine, and actually was a regular 
uh, you know, at least once a month in the Clayton Fletcher show uh, at Al's Club for at least two or three years where he was just coming through all the time. Oh, funny. I put him up all the time. And, you know, just uh, I remember when he first got MTV where they uh, they actually signed him to a contract where he was going to be like one of the people you saw on like a lot of different MTV shows like Guy Code and uh, some others. And they did like a dating show that he hosted. He even hosted the MTV Awards in Europe one year because they were trying oh, wow. to like, have him be like really associated with MTV. When that contract expired, Andrew decided to move on and continue working on his own stuff. But yeah, it's a, it's a great example of uh, how nowadays, as Al mentioned, the gatekeepers are gone. I mean, if you have content that you want to put out, you can put it out and find your own audience, uh, whether you're it. an unknown comic or someone that's been around for many years. It, it really makes no difference. But getting back to your pilot, Chris, is this going to be uh, kind of your life story? I know like recently, uh, like Pete Davidson did his uh, King of Staten Island or whatever, which was basically kind of really loosely based on his own life experience yeah. is that kind of where, where you started they always say write what you know so is that what you did write what you know exactly exactly that's that's exactly what i did i, I wrote what i know I, I knew and uh you know of course putting the comedic spin on it like we always do but a lot of these stories are based on you know, real things uh that happened uh through the 15 years give us an example and uh <laughs> <laughs> Just some of the, the the customers and the employees were characters uh, unto themselves, and uh, uh, there was oh my God, there's so many things. I'm just there was one time, uh, you know, we we'd have incidents with customers where I remember there was a guy in the parking lot that was used to pay people to stand on his face barefoot. I'm like, you know, something like that it would blow my mind. So. You know, in the pilot, there is a scene like that where, you know, I'm thinking I got everything. We cleaned it up and it's everything's going to be, uh, you know, we're going to get normal people coming in. Then all of a sudden a customer runs in and says, there's somebody in the parking lot paying people to stand on his face. I'm like, God, oh, Christ. And I got to go out there with a with a broom and like get him out of there. Um, <laughs> with a broom. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, that would be the tool I would use as well. Just sweep it's that like, right off the street. There was, there was many times I, 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 I like to fool myself that I was having had a legitimate career because it paid well, too, at the time. Uh, and I, and I would fool myself and then every once in a while, something like that would happen. I'm like, I'm working in a porno store. <laughs> it's a high end porno store. Okay. Yeah. It's high end. It's an adult high end with, the, with the neon lights and the sitting area for the husbands and adult yes. emporium play a little football on the TV. All these things, like ideas I got from like retail uh, books that I used to read, uh, you know, that other company, like major companies were doing, they knew that they had to uh, somehow get the man to stay in the store longer. So that's why you saw these little living rooms popping up with TVs. Right. Um, hey, they do that in malls all the time, genius, right? Of course. Genius. Yeah. I used yeah. to dread going to the mall with my wife. And then one day my wife said to me, you know, Al, there's a, there's a sitting area where you could just sit in beautiful comfort. And I would show up there with the Sunday Times and I would just sit there and read the paper in a comfortable chair with eight other husbands, you know? <laughs> they, thought, they, that, they, they thought of you. It took them a while to come around. Uh, but there was one book I read. It was on retail psychology, which is amazing. They say, like, when some, they say when somebody walks into your store, they are not mentally in your store yet until they're 10 feet in. So any retail products, you, if you try to sell anything within, like they say, the first five to 10 feet, it's not going to sell because – there, that's where they're, um, you know, it's funny too, so comparing to stand up comedy. Uh, Carlos Mencia, when he comes to governors on Long Island, he has his guys sell his merch outside on tables, which I thought was genius because so many times when people are leaving a club, they're in that mind, I must get out, I must get out, I gotta right, get out, right. you know. So if you try to sell merch by the door, they'd walk by you, blah, blah, blah. But then people go outside, they light their cigarettes, they're hanging out. And they'd walk over to his table. It was, I was amazed by that. I was so so smart. Well, you know, even like supermarkets, you know, people think that supermarkets are created and have very, it's very random where everything is, Dude. but they're laid out a certain way where the meats are in a certain place and the fruits and vegetables are in a certain place. And you're forced to walk through aisles of nonsense to go get the everyday staples that you want. Right. You they know? call that lost leader. L lost leader, they call that, where, yeah. say, the milk, 
they, the supermarkets don't make a lot of money on milk at all, but they have it where you got to walk through the store to get to it. So I said, what can I do? What can I do like milk? So, you know, you could take, you could buy like a uh, hundred vibrators uh, and, and sell them at the cheapest ass price and then put an ad in like a the local paper and people are coming. Hey, where are those vibrators? Oh, you got to go to the back of the store. You know, but meanwhile, they just walk through the lingerie. They just walk through the Spencer's gifts area, you know? That's right. That's why you find like the houseware items in a department store and the furniture or housewares or stuff like that on the top floor. Because right. when people, you know, nobody makes an impulse buy and says, hey, I'll buy a hammer. You know, you're going into a store, you need pots and pans or you need a hammer. And they make you go through four flights of elevators where you suddenly see, you know, the, the, the fashionable women's clothing or you see the fashionable men's clothing. And then, you know, you make pit stops on your way to four, you know. There's and no how do you know that uh, in the industry that's near and dear to our hearts, the casino industry, uh, the original purpose of the slot machine was basically the opposite of what you guys said about the living rooms and the department store being a place for men. The slot machines were there to theoretically entertain the wives while the husband gambled big on wow. roulette and craps or whatever. But nowadays, casinos make up to 75% of their gaming revenue from the slot machines because things have really flipped. And now it's yeah, more like you a know, game and it appeals to, uh, to the men more. But, yeah, the original slot machines were not a big moneymaker for the casinos. It was like, well, if he's going to bet all his money at Blackjack, let's let her see if she can get three sevens for a penny or whatever. Oh, wait, but, you know, one of, one of the big mistakes a lot of – I feel as a marketer, you know – Yes, I understand the casinos look at the numbers and say slots are probably the biggest revenue producer, much more than, you know, uh, table games or poker or a sports book or a horse book. But I think they make a very big mistake in that they're not counting what you learned in the lingerie business, Chris, and, you know, what we see in, um, in, in uh, shopping malls, and that is, if a husband likes to play something stupid like the horses and you're licensed and you can have every one of these products in your casino, I don't understand why they don't have every casino doesn't have a little horse book, a little sports book. Yeah, it doesn't make money as much as the, uh, uh, as the slots. But when my wife and I make a decision, I like to play the horses too. So when we make a decision and we go, let's say, to play poker, if one of us gets knocked out of a game, we want to be able to go to another game where we can have some fun and enjoy. And if for me it's horses or poker, every casino should have every product that they're licensed for. And a lot of times my wife and I will make a decision and say, well, Hard Rock in Atlantic City is a beautiful casino, but they don't have a horse book or they don't have poker. So I'm not going to go there, I, I, you know, so I'll go somewhere else. And Borgata has everything you want. Poker, yes. sports book, uh, everything. A great comedy and that's club. that's why, coincidentally, great they're the number club, one yeah. casino, yeah. right? Yeah. They, um, you know, it's interesting, Clayton, you're talking about the slot machines. I, I, there's a comic that uh, a friend of mine that she, uh, Sherry Davey, years and years Sherry. ago, years and years ago, she dated a, a guy that was uh, in the casino business. And I remember her telling me that if you look at the, they have these, I guess they call them like sucker machines. You ever see those big giant machines with the big yes. angle and the light, sex in the oh, city? Yeah. Those are <laughs> I'm those the are, idiot that likes those. Yeah, machines. those are they try to pull you into the middle of the casino by those machines, just almost like similar to the the milk, the lost leader, so to speak. Those are they call them the sucker machines. I like those machines the best because they have <laughs> for big guys like us, they have the most comfortable seats, right? Yes. Sit back, you lounge back there. Yes. <laughs> Get a massage, yes. lose all your money. It's a good time. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm a big on the sucker seats. Al, I love when they came out the Borgata, they came out with those uh those roulette machines that were like uh how would you call them, mechanic or something. There was no dealer. The ball would just pop out and you yeah. didn't have all Everybody had seats. There was no people. One thing about roulette, when I would play roulette, once people started leaning over me and reaching over me, I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, the crap, yeah, the craps table is like that. I can never understand why 
right. you know, they, they don't start putting chairs, like high top chairs by the crap table. Right. You know, people, you know, you, you don't want to stand for hours and hours and hours, you know. And there's wanna, some kind there, of psychological reason. I don't know what it is, but there there's got to be some reason. Like these casino guys, they don't do things randomly. They have some reason why you know, maybe they've studies prove that people lose more money if you make them stand up i don't have yeah, any maybe. idea what it could be but i was just you know guys i was just talking on a podcast something similar uh al as far as comedy clubs there you can have a comedy club seat that's too comfortable where people tend to be like too relaxed and i, I like comedy club chairs are just comfortable enough for your ass for a comedy show <laughs> yeah that, i've worked on that philosophy for many years you know uh, yeah. we we don't uh, we don't promote comfort in our room <laughs> you know in steve okay. martin's amazing book born standing up he talks about how the comedy club setup should be a little uncomfortable. Like you don't want people to be complaining that they're so uncomfortable, but if the audience is too cozy, like if it's a little too warm or the seat's a little too soft or, right. or, or the people are too, a little too spread out, it kind of kills the, the vibe. Like you want that agitated alert on the edge of your seat kind of vibe. And that's what makes the best audiences. So Al, you were really onto something when you decided to buy the cheaper chairs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, give me those cheap stackables, you know. Yeah, the cheap <laughs> stackables. Like, like I think I think I heard it was like uh, Buddy Hackett would, in his contract, the room had to be before he went on stage, say sixty three degrees. Yeah, on cold. Kevin can wait. Uh, some of the I remember some of the actresses complaining how cold it was, and I remember the director Andy Fickman said said comedy works best in the cold. It's so true. And you know yeah, we found that out over the, uh, over the uh, winter with some of these outdoor stand-up shows in the winter in, in the park or on rooftops <laughs> right. people laugh a lot more when they're freezing i guess yeah, yeah well, you get too too warm it's like i've done comedy rooms where it's like stifling and i remember one time i did a show in a, a comedy club upstate and the guy says to me listen man he's a restaurant right he was doing the comedy in a restaurant his restaurant he goes my acs aren't working that well so don't mention how warm it is in the room i'm like guy <laughs> I'm 6'6", 280. Wait do you see how I melt up there. I'll be, yeah, right. How do I not mention it when I'm the sweat is dripping down my face? They see the size of me? Yeah, whether you mention it or not, the audience is <laughs> going to know. Yeah. You know, yeah. real briefly, because I think we might be getting close to tight on time, but Chris, what have you been doing stand-up comedy-wise during the pandemic? Have you done these out show shows? Have you, yeah. have you, have you been on the, the back of a truck? Or what have you been doing? I have. I, I've tried. Um, early on, I did one of those. Uh, I think it was for, uh, Jay Nog. I did one of those. He's got the show at a diner where I had to try just for the experience where people are, when they think you're funny, they flash their lights at you. <laughs> the the drive-in shows. Right. And then on the flip side, you know, I over in, uh, what was it? It's uh, Royersford. This guy, guy, Joel Richardson, has these uh, outdoor shows, which is just phenomenal where. He's been doing an incredible job. Joel. Joel. He, Soul Joe, he put down, he, he said he got like four truckloads of beach sand. One night I went there uh, with G uh, Gary Valentine. 500 people showed up in July. 500 people with their lawn. Yeah, shirt. he's really hustling and really, really doing a great job. In what and it just shows doing. you how people are starving for live entertainment. I, I did a podcast on anxiety the other day with uh, Snake Sabo, the guitarist from Skid Row. And him too like he can't wait to get back out there and and there he, there's like this uh there's just like this um it's like a, a drought for people are just starving for live entertainment yeah arts and entertainment is great um and so important to just enjoying life on earth and it's just not the same doing netflix every day like people need to get out and see something in real life so it's really hard and you know we're just ready for everything to come back and Hopefully oh. these vaccinations will keep happening and, yeah. and, you know, the pandemic will continue to subside and then we can hopefully get a uh, Broadway comedy club up and running again. What do you say to that, Al? Yes. I right, listen, I'm ready. I've been ready for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we say goodbye, Chris, anything else you want people to know, like where they can find you online or, or where they can follow the progress of your pilot, anything like that? Um, well, you can follow chrisroachlive.com is my website or at Roach, Co uh, at Roach Comic on Instagram. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. I'll, I'll have some hopefully news uh, soon about the pilot. I, the goal is again to like, uh, there's a show called Smilf um, where 
again, they, they take the different approach. Instead of your, your standard pitch to a network, she took this sitcom and put it in film festivals, and that's how it got picked up. So that you gotta think you gotta think outside the box, like we were talking about Andrew Schultz and stuff like that. You're thinking outside the box and just taking your career into your own hands. Absolutely. Al, any final thoughts? It's been a great show, very insightful, and uh, I'm looking forward to what's next on uh, Christopher's uh, journey. Absolutely. Likewise. Well, Chris, can't wait to be back at Broadway. Yeah, Chris, we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, for Chris Roach, for Al Martin, and for our wonderful producer, Jay Frank, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you all so much for listening. I just like to bitch. Hi, Al Martin here, owner of the Broadway Comedy Club and Greenwich Village Comedy Club in New York City. And I just authored a great book on stand-up comedy and my 30-year journey called Did It on a Dare, How I Built a Comedy Empire in 30 Short Years. So if you want an interesting story on the comedy scene in the 90s and early 2000s up until the present, if you're an aspiring comic and want to learn about some of my golden rules of comedy from a comedy club owner, this is the book for you. It's available on Amazon. And just go to Amazon, click Al Martin, and it'll take you right to my page. It's available on audio and Kindle, as well as paperback. Thank you.